All right, so what we want to do today is just introduce you uh, to proteins. Uh, if you're doing biology again, it's, you're going to be at a distinct advantage because proteins is something you talk about all the time because you're always looking about structures for DNA, yeah? Is that what you're doing, biology? That's the one, okay? So, just to start off in relation to what we have to cover for proteins, not a huge amount um, in the section, um, but some of it, I, I hope, is reasonably straightforward. So, the idea of a protein um, basically starts off with what is an amino acid. And what I've done up here, as Jack asked me before, what have, I, what have I actually drawn here? Well, I've tried to basically show you that a protein is a series of amino acids in a long chain. Now, if you're doing DNA, the chain happens to be a certain shape, okay, as you would be aware of, the double helix type idea, or a single helix, depending on what part of the uh, structure you're looking at. So we've got an amino acid bonded to an amino acid along the chain. If you've done biology, or doing biology, you'll see this come up. You ever seen that? Yeah. Biology people? Okay. So if you look at this, it's called the primary structure of a protein molecule. And the primary structure is simply right down, so we sort of start off with a, with a molecule that's huge, and we look at it from the outside, and we look at the magnified straight down, and we look at well, each amino acid, what makes up the chain. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is G, and the G would correspond to an amino acid which is glutamine. Yeah. If we see T, that would be tyrosine, which is another amino acid somewhere there in our book, okay, on page 275. You don't have to know the names of the amino acids, by the way. You don't know those, you just need to have a, a, an idea of the general structure, all right? And where they where they basically come from. There are 20, um, if you look in the sector lesson, there's a bit more information, but there are 20 um, essential amino acids. And where do we get amino acids from? Where do we get amino acids from? Food. Food, alright? So this is what we talk about, a balanced diet, okay? So people that don't have a balanced diet, you know when, when that guy did the Hungry Jacks yeah. thing, what's it called? Um, yeah. Super size me or something, was it called? Yeah, for 30 days? Every day. Every day for 30 days. Um, and so he was only getting a pretty... Like what was it? Like what was it? Like hmm. Horrible. I had on Jackson Friday night. We didn't, we didn't have anything else. It was disgusting. But anyway. So, um, basically, 20 amino acids, alright? And your body needs those 20 amino acids to make all the proteins in your body, okay? Uh, that generate all the enzymes for us to be able to function. So it's a very complicated process. The general structure of amino acid, besides so it's bifunctional. The reason why it's bifunctional is it's got an amine group on one end. Okay, so we've actually identified that already. And so when we see an amine functional group, you should be thinking in your head, what reactions do amines undergo? And of course we know that amines are what reactions do amines undergo? What are we doing with section amines? They don't make esters. No, we don't use amine esters. What do they do? Jack, what do they do? Yeah, they're basic. All right? So they can only do one thing. All they can do is an acceptor proton. That's it. So when you think about amines, you need to think that these are always going to behave like a base because they've got an electron pair and they can bond to a H+. The other end is our... What's that functional group, Craig? What's that one? Carboxylic acid. Okay. So, what do we know about carboxylic acids? They're acidic. Good. So, they're going to donate a proton. So, these are going to be acidic. Alright. Uh, what other things did we learn about carboxylic acids? There's a bit of revision here as well. So, what else did we do? If I asked you how would you make a carboxylic acid, not that it's got anything to do with the protein, uh, molecule or amino acid, but if I asked you to make a carboxylic acid, what would it come from? Primary alcohol. Okay? Oxidation of primary alcohol. Alright? Reflux and then distill. These are things you've got to keep in your head. Alright, that's not made, that's not how we make an amino acid. So this is, this is acidic, if I were to test for that, what reaction could I use to test for a carboxylic acid? Polymers. 
Gee, some of you got some revision to do. All right. Yeah, carbon dioxide is the product, but what do we put in it to get carbon dioxide released? Hydrogen carbonate or any carbonate structure, right? Any soluble carbonate. So, although that's not a test we do for amino acid, all right, it could be in a question somewhere, all right? Because it's got that functional group. All right, now, um, the characteristic of an amino acid, if we were to isolate amino acids, which we can do, is that they exist in two structures and they're in equilibrium. Because we've got an acid and a base in the one molecule. And hopefully you can see that it just makes sense that if I've got an acid and a base together, well obviously this is going to behave as an acid and it's going to go donate the proton to the base. And so we end up with this thing here. Anybody speak German? How do we, how do we pronounce that? Zwitter iron, it's pronounced Zwitter. 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 Zwitter iron. Apparently not. So that's how it's pronounced, right? So that is a structure, it's called a Zwitter iron. I guess that guy came up with that structure. W, W, S, W. Yeah, S, W, Zwitter iron. Two words. That's an I, O, N. Is that Yeah. That's an I, O, U. What? Sweater, it's an N. What do you owe me? Sweater irons, okay, is what they're called. Because it is ionic. But the important point to note is that it is, it's a neutral structure. So we don't really know whether the structure for the amino acid is here or here. Okay, because it's neutral. This is neutral, this is neutral. Okay. Now, if you do a little bit of reading, um, let's just do a very, very quick amount of reading, okay, for our sweater ions. Obviously, it depends on the pH of the solution, okay? So, so in a pH neutral environment, oh, and that's, that's a good point. If it's pH neutral, that's how it's going to exist, okay? If I had pH less than 7, what's, it, what's it going to look like, do you think? If it's pH less than 7. It's going to mainly exist as. If it's pH less than 7, okay, it's in an acidic environment. So, how would the structure look if it was acidic? If I had it in acidic, in acid, stomati, how would it look? Yeah, but if I had this in, in excess acid, It's going to be in the protonated form. Yeah. Okay? This would be the acidic version. If I've got lots and lots of acid present, that's going to be protonated. Okay? If it's in the base, if it was a pH greater than 7, the other way, it's going to have this over here. Okay? If it was alkaline, all right, it's going to favour this side of the structure. All right? So that can change depending on the pH of the system. Something I didn't pick up when I was running through it a minute ago. All right, now, um, the question is as follows. Um, and I'll just clarify that, not be with the with your dad. So if we started off with this structure here, for example, um, and we just put a carbon there. If I had that in a, an acid environment, okay, is what I was saying, all right, it's gonna look like this. So it would be NH3 plus, Okay, C O O H. That would that would be the favoured iron. We can't have both of them. Okay, in that environment, this is pH seven. So we're going to have that happen at pH seven, All right? If we put it one, one in one direction, pH or the other, we get a okay a different form of protonation. If I have that, and if I have it in a base environment, okay. Then it's going to behave like this. It would be, oh, see, oops, excuse me, I'm going to get a phone call. That's good. That's my, my phone. I'll get it in a minute. Sorry. I'll just ignore him for a second. All right. Um, it's my brother. Um, so basically, we've got up here, we'll get our NH2, and if it's under 
um, in this case the alkaline conditions, it would look like what? It's going to be in those, that's, that's the, the preferred iron. Okay? Now, so that's what I was trying to say in relation to pH over there. Is everybody okay with that one? So pH 7, we're going to have both okay, present, it'll be neutral. If it's an acid dominated, that'll be protonated. If it's a base dominated, then we're going to have the negative ion and carboxylate. That'll be the dominant structure. All right, that's one of the questions that we've got to do in a minute as well. Okay. All right, now, I want to work on to proteins and the peptide structure. I'm going to just get rid of some of this here, because uh, I don't want to confuse you too much with that structure. Now, we're going to move on to a section on uh, polymers uh, in the next few lessons. Well, you're going, to, you're going to start to teach yourself polymers when I'm not here. Um, and polymers are long chain molecules. But polymers are not natural. Polymers are synthetic. All right? Although, having said that, there are some natural polymers that exist in the environment, okay? But most of the stuff that we've got in our textbook is all synthetic polymers. And obviously a protein is a bit like a polymer. Similar to a polymer, and it's got amino acid, bonded to amino acid, bonded to amino acid. Okay? Did we do polymers in year 10? No. No? You didn't have a good teacher in year 10. Alright. So, over there hanging up is polyvinyl chloride. So the idea of a polymer is it has a monomer, one structure, repeated again, and again, and again, and again, along the chain. So we have a repeating unit for a polymer. An amino acid does not have a repeating unit. Okay? So amino acid is made up of, sorry, amino acid, a protein is made up of a sequence of amino acids. And the sequence can repeat itself, okay? But this is obviously your genetic makeup. Okay? So the sequence is what we're after. So it is still a long okay, molecule and the building blocks of a protein molecule are amino acids. If I put one amino acid, and here it is over here, um, next to another amino acid which is next to another one, and I haven't named these amino acids, they can form a protein structure. And I'm going to need to get rid of some of this stuff and I'll redo the protein structure I think probably at the top there. So what happens is this, this is a peptide bond in a structure. What does it look like? We've done the functional group already. What's that functional group? I think I've got it on there, haven't I? Amide. It's an, actually, it's an amide functional group, okay? But when it's in a naturally occurring product like a protein, we don't call it an amide, we call it a peptide, okay? Once we get to looking at what happens here, if you remember we were asked what happens, or one of the things we talked about when we made an amine, sorry, when we, when we were producing an amide, we had a, a carboxylic acid and an amine coming together. Remember that structure? And I said it forms a salt in the middle, we heat the salt and we again end up with an amide. What we're getting here is an amide produced here, and an amide produced here, and it goes on and on and on, depending on how many amino acids we've got in the protein. So these come together, and it's called a condensation reaction, because water uh, will be the byproduct of this reaction. And if I just redraw the structure, uh, and I'll get rid of that there, just redraw that structure now, and, and again you'll get a few questions like this uh, shortly. So what we get now, and I'll just transfer that straight up to here, so it would look like this if I were to begin to draw this particular protein. Now I like to try and align the amino acids under one another as best I can. Makes it a lot easier. If you don't do that, it gets a bit confusing. So over here, I've got it like a nitrogen there, it goes down to a H. And I've got over here, that's my another amino acid, and it's got a CH2, CH3. Then over here, I've got a, actually then another one there, and it's going to form over here an NH, and then a CH, 
some sort of a weirdo structure here. That'll have a name, code, and that will go on. And this is just one part. This is simply one part of the chain, all right, for a protein molecule. Any protein? Any protein. I haven't picked up anything in particular yet. This is just three amino acids. I'm just showing you how they bond together to form a protein structure. And what we're looking at here is a primary structure for the protein because we're actually looking at the amino acids. Now, what you need to be able to do with a protein is to go backwards and uh, work out what the amino acids were used, or what, what, what the amino acids or the blocks, building blocks were in the structure for the protein. And so the easiest way to do that is pick out all of the links in the chain first. So the link that I just rubbed off, here's our link here. So what we were after was a peptide link. There it is. So I have to be able to identify all the peptide links in the chain. So here's one here, and here's another link here in the chain. And these would repeat themselves. I'll keep keeping on going, but I'm going to fall around. All right? So the first thing that I would ask you in a question is identify the peptide link. Very important that you can pick that out of the structure. But it's not complex because it repeats itself over and over again. Now, once you've identified the peptide link, all you need to do is cut the molecule in the middle of the peptide link between the carbon double bond, oxygen, and the nitrogen. Carbon double bond, oxygen, and the nitrogen. Now working backwards, all right, hopefully you can see that this would be the actual amino acid number one in the chain, and so you could be asked to draw, and you will, okay, be asked to draw that amino acid. Here is another amino acid, that's number two, we're gonna call it, okay, and here is my third amino acid. So you could be given the chain, the peptide chain, and asked to identify the amino acids. You could be given the amino acids and asked to draw the peptide to go either way in terms of what you are expected to know. All right, any questions on just that structure there? Too easy? We'll see. We'll see when we get to do some questions on it. All right? The, the biggest thing that, uh, that really affects uh, people with this one um, is that the molecules look big. Okay? Don't get scared off of big molecules because you're going to see them all the time. Okay? Um, and that's the organic part of your exam. They'll give you a molecule that you haven't seen before. And it's not a simple molecule. Okay? It'll be a complex molecule. So what do you do? What do you do? Panic. No, you don't panic. What do you do? It's a molecule you never, you've never seen before. Functional groups. You start with functional groups. You've learnt the functional groups. So you've learnt the functional groups. All we do in an exam is apply your understanding of the concept. So if I've got a primary alcohol in a molecule, can you find that primary alcohol? And then you can you react it and see what it undergoes or what it produces if you react it with dichromate. Change the functional group to an aldehyde. All right? Or a couple of sort of gases, depending on the conditions. It's got an amide in there. Find the amide. Is it an amine? Find the amine. All those things we've learned already, this is where you need to go back and revise them. Okay? You have to have all that content in your head to apply all the organic. It doesn't get any simpler, it gets more complex. Alright, now, one thing I didn't say is that once we get lots and lots of these together, it's not called a peptide anymore, it's called a polypeptide. So, poly, just like I used to describe a polymer before, many, means many. So lots of amino acids in the chain forms a protein molecule. Okay. Now, I am just going to touch on briefly, because we've got a fantastic video, um, what we call two, or basically the structures of, an, of a protein molecule. And we have to talk about these, it's primary, secondary, tertiary, and we say the quaternary structure. Okay? Now, I'm going to sort of run through this very, very, uh, very briefly because we've got the video that's going to explain it that I'll run in a minute. So the primary structure basically is right down to the sequence 
of the amino acids. That's how we define the primary structure. You need to watch that video, okay, of Mr. Anderson because it can explain it much better than I can. The secondary structure. For those of you that are doing biology, how can you explain the secondary structure for a an a bro, sorry for a protein? Damati, what is it? When it folds. When it folds back on itself. Yeah. Okay. So the secondary structure is the shape formed when the protein secondary bonds to itself. Now, it's a little bit complex. It's not a little bit, it's very complex. Yep. Proteins. Okay? We're talking about protein. Secret, this is, so it's a protein. So if this is my protein here, Jack, it's got a sequence of amino acids. If I said what's the primary structure, you would have to go right down to the level and say it is this amino acid and this amino acid and this amino acid. That's what I mean by primary structure. Okay? If I said what is the secondary structure, you would have to tell me what shape this protein forms. Okay, when I, when, I, when I mean shape, is it going to be like a helix shape? Okay, or is it going to be a shape, I don't know, like that? Whatever. Okay, so that's the shape that the protein will form. Now, I haven't talked about one other thing. Because this has got, okay, sections on it, okay, when I say sections, I should say polar sites, hopefully you can work out depending on what these functional groups are here, this chain could bend back on itself and because we've got an NH here, it's possible, it is possible that somewhere down in the structure it can actually bend or fold back on itself and if I had for example another um, polymer down there or even could be that same polymer this is a positive slightly, that's a negative slightly, I can get a H bond between those two. And it depends a lot on these structures here about the shape of the molecule. Okay, or the shape of the protein. Alright, what's the tertiary structure? When it interacts with another one. When it interacts with another one. Okay, can you give me an example? Would that be the tertiary or a quaternary structure? Yeah, alright. So we're going to jump because the, the quaternary structure is where you get um, many proteins forming a complex, I'm going to use the word enzyme, okay, a complex protein. Now, all right, whenever we do this, best as an example, and some of you mentioned hemoglobin as an example of a quaternary structure. So we've, basically the way to think of this is that from primary we started right inside the molecule, then we've gone one step outside the molecule, then we've looked at its combination with other molecules. So if this is a protein here, and if this is a protein, it's when these bond together, okay? That's the tertiary structure, okay? More than one. But when you have many proteins coming together, that's the level, okay, that we're looking at. It's called the quaternary structure. So, hemoglobin, okay, basically has got a few proteins in it. I think it's four in total, is that right? I think it's four proteins that make up hemoglobin. Is that right? Mason? The tertiary is where two, yep. two proteins two come together. Come together and yep. Two or more or just two? Two. And the, what is it? The quaternary. Quaternary is where there's more. It's not always four, it can be more than four. Yeah, but it's more than two. Yes, greater than two. Amen. Alright? Now, this structure here, and I'll, I'll run it for you again in a minute, okay? The, the, the protein uh, hemoglobin, I've been using that word, right? Is that protein or is it an enzyme? How, how do you describe it in biology? An enzyme. 
Enzyme, enzyme enzyme. means it's a catalyst. Enzyme means it's a catalyst. So would you, in biology, do they say that um, a hemoglobin is a catalyst or an enzyme? Protein. Protein, all right. So we'll say it's a protein, all right? Now, the point is, if we didn't have hemoglobin, we have a bit of a problem. What's the problem if we don't have hemoglobin? We can't absorb oxygen into the blood. We can't get oxygen into the blood, we can't get it to our cells. Okay? So we need that in order to undergo that metabolic process called respiration. So this protein molecule is designed, okay, by creation, if you want to look at it like that, amazingly, to fit an oxygen molecule in. Okay, so the shape of the molecule determines its functionality. All right, and that's very, very important. That's how proteins work in the body. Certain shaped proteins have a certain function. Okay, if you change the shape of the, pro of the protein, what happens to the functionality of the protein? No function. It doesn't work anymore. Okay? Now, an example, Olympic Games right at the moment. Okay? And sometimes uh, people that do the, um, the really, uh, the long races like marathons um, will sometimes go into meltdown. Have you seen that scenario before? I don't think it's happening at Rio, but um, you might see people that are trying to do a marathon and they extend themselves, they keep on going. And then they have, it becomes a medical emergency where they have. They call it heat exhaustion, okay? And it's a medical emergency. Why is heat exhaustion a medical emergency? It's because the temperature that the person works best at. Good. It's like exactly. He's used two terms above the temperature that the protein works at, and it begins to denature the protein. So the thing with this secondary bonding in proteins, and you will be aware, all right, what we've done, done in theory so far, if I heat any molecule, I'm breaking secondary bonds. If I break secondary bonds, it's very critical for a protein because it breaks the structure, it, it changes the shape. And changing the shape, changing shape, all right, uh, in a protein sense, I'm talking about changing shape here, we use the word denature. It denatures the protein, which is not good. Because once a protein is denatured, once I've done that, okay, all right, I cannot go back to the original protein. So this is my protein here. If we look at it from an equilibrium perspective, if I apply heat to the protein, okay, I'll think that's oh, okay. I'll just go and get cooled down and everything will be normal again. No, it won't. It's not reversible, okay? So I can't get these bonds to reform again to make the original shape. So people that go into heat exhaustion have to be treated very, very quickly because the heat begins to break down the cells in the body. The cells die, okay? And they call that like, it's called meltdown. Like the, your muscles literally go to liquid because the muscles are made up of protein and that you can't recover it again. Like once the muscle's gone, it's gone. It doesn't really grow back again, all right? It's not a good thing. Not to mention the fact that it has a neuron because if you lose a neuron, gone. You can't sort of say, oh, well, I'll grow one tomorrow, and you've got a certain number to work with, and I think I'm a few down to read. All right, anyway, changing shape is called denaturing, and Stamati used the word denaturing and heat, all right? So we're breaking secondary bonds. The other way we can actually denature proteins is by changing the pH, okay? So pH is very important in terms of balance in the blood, in your body. So if, you, if, the, if your blood is too acidic or too basic, that becomes an issue, again, it becomes a medical emergency because your blood needs to have a neutral pH, all right, in order for the proteins to work normally. What does pH, in, what does pH change this? How does pH affect pH bonding? It's a bit more complex, but if we were to change the pH, what's that gonna do? H plus, so we had this widow iron on here before. So if I had this, if I had this, and I added acid to this, if I made this an acid environment, all of these 
are going to protonate. That's going to protonate. This one here is a base, it's going to protonate. So what happens to the H bonds? They're gone. The H bonds no longer can be formed, okay, in the protein. If I've, if I've lost the H bonds, lots of shape. Lots of shape, pretty much I'm dead. Okay? Now, um, I was going to say something else. I'll come back in a minute. Alright, so that's the terms of denaturing the protein. Oh, the egg. If you've ever done it in biology, okay, just cooking an egg is a great example of denaturing a protein. You know what egg white looks like, don't you? Anyone, anyone cooked eggs recently? Jack, one person, you and me, alright? So, when you've got the egg, um, obviously you've got the yolk, okay, and the egg white. And we know that the egg white is, is great if you're bodybuilding like me, alright? Because it's got six grams of protein in egg white, yeah? It can't get any more. That's about the best natural protein without using steroids. <laughs> okay, there's something I wrote this morning about a guy who's using steroids. Um, and all sorts of things dropped off. So, um, so very high in protein. So when you cook the egg, you are denaturing the protein. It's a very simple experiment. Exactly. So you've actually changed the structure of the protein. Now, has anybody ever seen an egg go back to like liquid? No. They've done it in Adelaide at Flinders. Okay. Now the way they did it was a little bit smart. So what they did with that, we were talking about this last year when we were doing this same section. I think it came up last year. So when you denature a protein, you actually change the structure. Okay, you, you change the, the shape. And that's what happens when you heat an egg. Whether you boil it, fry it, what are you going to do? What they did um, at Flinders was they took the egg white and they put it in a centrifuge. What do you think they happen? What do you think happened in a centrifuge? You know how a centrifuge works. So you've got test tubes, okay? Test tubes are spun around at a very high speed, and it, the any liquid, any solid is forced to the bottom, okay? So the function of the centrifuge was to, and if you can understand this concept, it'll be very good. The, fu the function of the centrifuge was to actually to break the bonds that were formed when the egg was heated and denatured initially. So they turned the egg from being cooked into uncooked. But what they had to do was, they had, had to physically, by using physics, all right, had to physically put a force on that egg white, it broke the bonds, turned it back into a liquid, and then as it cooled, it allowed it to slowly go back to the original shape. So they did. They uncooked an egg. All right. Now, that's apparent. Yeah, it was in the newspaper. You can look it up. Jack. So we talked about how um, proteins like collapse once they heat it. Yes. What happens like after they're not boiling? Hypothermia. Yeah. Hypothermia. That's because well, hypothermia is the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Hypothermia means you're you're boiling. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It doesn't denature your proteins. It doesn't. You just put it like, put into storage. It just stop. That's it. Can they awaken the? Don't know. Don't know. And, and that's the. Um, I guess that's the risk you take, isn't it? Right. Yeah. I don't know whether you'd want, want that to happen. I know. It's a bit weird. Okay. Any more questions in relation to proteins or denaturing proteins or cryogenics? Yep, we're going to do questions. Oh, what time do you need to leave? We'll, we'll finish off there.